Dear Minister, dear speakers, and all of you viewers who have signed up for today's live streamed event, a very warm welcome to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. We're here today to discuss what should be done to maintain momentum and climate ambitions towards next year's COP26. The theme of today's seminar is a Danish-British dialogue on cutting carbon, green recovery, and partnerships. And we'll discuss climate ambitions as well as partnerships between public and private stakeholders. Denmark and the United Kingdom have shared interests in supporting and inspiring each other to achieve ambitious goals, not only for COP26, but also to help catalyze a green transition in general. First, we will hear presentations from both sides of the North Sea. They will be followed by two fireside chats that will discuss the role of the private sector in reaching ambitious climate goals. We are also very happy to have with us today a city representative, namely the Deputy Mayor of London, Ms. Shirley Rodriguez, to underline the importance of uh, the important role of cities in this respect. My name is Finn Mortensen, and I'm the Executive Director of State of Green. I will act as your moderator today and make sure we make it through the next hour in the best way. Today's event is organized in a partnership between Denmark's biggest business organization, Confederation of Danish Industry, the Danish Embassy in London, and State of Green. And on behalf of all the organizers, I look forward to the discussions over the next minute over the next hour or so so let's get started the first speaker today will be um, the danish minister for climate energy and utilities mr dan johansen you may know that denmark the danish government and uh, a very broad majority in the danish parliament has set an ambitious target ambitious target to reduce denmark's co2 emissions by 70 percent by 2030. Last year, the Danish government launched 13 so-called climate partnerships with the private sector and invited the partnerships to submit their recommendations on how to reach that goal. For decades, a strong collaboration between the public and the, and the, pub the, public and the private sector has been a key feature of the Danish Green Transition, and these climate partnerships are testament to that. Now we'll be pleased to hear from the minister who will participate online. Minister Dan Jansen, the stage is yours. Good afternoon. It's a grey afternoon in Copenhagen and we're in the middle of very serious times. The COVID-19 crisis is an unprecedented health crisis that affects us all. I hope that you are all well and that your families uh, are well in these difficult times. The climate crisis is still here. We cannot forget in our eagerness to fight the current pandemic that we still need to keep uh, our focus on the much bigger lasting climate crisis. And actually, if we look at it, the difficult times that we're in also gives us possibilities. Because we know that within the next months and years, governments across the planet will facilitate the restart of economies with policies, with allocating resources that can be used to also enhance the green transformation. I have had the honor of co-leading a series of international meetings with the International Energy Agency on this specific topic. How do we make sure that the stimulus packages, the economic restart policies that are being implemented across the globe right now are also green? There are many answers to that question, but the most simple ones are probably make sure that we don't invest in old fashioned fossil fuels driven technologies, but that we instead invest in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and that we look at ways of acting together, collaborating together across borders on these very, very important steps. In Denmark, we definitely aim to make our economic restart a green one. 
we want to build back better. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we intend to stay on track with our very ambitious climate change targets. We have pledged that we want to reduce our CO2 emissions by 70% in 2030 compared to 1990. Not only have we pledged it, we've also made a climate law that makes it a legally binding target. Now, this is an incredibly ambitious and difficult task. What we did was not the way you normally would analyze such a political question by asking what are the actual problems, what are the policy tools, what are the resources available, but instead turning uh, the whole picture the other way around and asking the scientists what is necessary to do if we are to, to fulfill our criteria within the Paris Agreement. And here the answer was clear. 70% reduction would be a fair share for Denmark, a fair burden share, so to speak. We don't look at it as a burden, though. We look at it as a possibility, as an opportunity for us to develop our countries. But if we then analyze how to achieve this target, we also have to admit that right now we only have the policy tools and instruments to get us to around 60%. So the last 10% of the reduction, we need to find new ways of achieving. This is going to be difficult on some parts of the solution, it's also going to be expensive. But the way we look at it is that this is a great opportunity for us, just as when John F. Kennedy in the 1960s said, we will put a man on the moon, not because it's easy, but because it's hard. We know, as he knew, that when you set yourself very ambitious targets, and then when you allocate the resources to actually do this, you will, in the process, develop new technology, you'll develop new ways of collaborating, new ways of uh, tackling uh, issues that you hadn't thought of before. So we are confident that when we approach uh, this question and we do it with an ambition to work in new ways, also with, with our industry, also with partners in other countries, we will actually end up becoming a more competitive country a country with a higher living standard than if we hadn't done this. And this is important, because if you want to be a front runner, if you want to be a country that other countries follow and find inspiration in, it's important that you don't make the transformation in a way that will lower your living standards for the people in your country, that will lead to losing jobs and competitive advantages, because if you do that, then other countries won't look at you and say, look, this is what we could do. They will look at you then and say, look, this is what we don't want to do. So it's important for us to do this in a balanced way. So what does this mean exactly? Well, let me give you one example. Denmark plans to build two energy islands. This will be the new era in offshore wind. We were the first country on the planet to establish an offshore wind farm in 1991. At that time, it wasn't really a very good business model to do that, but we did it because we saw that that is the future for wind power. Today, decades later, wind actually competes with coal in price, so we've gone a far way. The next step will be to find new ways of exploiting the wind. What we want to do is make two energy islands, one artificial one in the North Sea and Bornholm that's already there in the Baltic Sea. This gives us the possibility to have offshore wind farms connected to this one hub. This hub can, hub can then have connections to other countries and can also be the facility of new technologies like, for instance, Power to X. Power to X, what is that? Well, this is when you take the power from the wind, make it into hydrogen, and then make the hydrogen into liquid fuels. This is not science fiction, even though it might sound like science fiction. It's actually just science. We know how to do it. Now we need to find out how to scale it and how to make it cost efficient. When that happens, we will have a situation where you can take the wind from the wind turbines, the energy that that creates, and put it into uh, airplanes, so to speak. So you can fly on uh, a green fuel. That is the future, and this is what we aim to, aim to deliver. Now, the COP process uh, needs to find a new momentum. 
the meeting has had to be postponed in Glasgow till next year. I think that was a wise decision. Uh, we need to have many countries that, like Denmark, show what can actually be done. Uh, we also need uh, obligations from countries to make sure that the right financing is there, especially vis-a-vis -vis the developing countries. And finally, we need more ambitious reduction targets. So the NDCs that are now going to be uh, taken into stock need to be higher than they are now. We work in the European Union right now to enhance the European Union's target. Denmark is arguing that it needs to go to 65%. Uh, what we're looking at right now is a situation where the Commission has proposed at least 55%, which is supported by, fortunately, a group of countries. So it is my hope that the EU can also be an ambitious uh, leader there. A new president in the United States of America uh, has already pledged that he will uh, reintroduce uh, the United States into the Paris Agreement, which is, of course, uh, great news and which gives us hope for alliance building across the Atlantic, but not only across the Atlantic, across the planet for this very, very important task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Dan Jørgensen. It was a great pleasure to hear your views on, on this uh, very uh, topic. Now we were supposed to have had the uh, UK government special representative for climate change, Nick Bridge, uh, from London. Unfortunately, he is facing some technical difficulties, but we hope he will be on later. Instead, we will move on to the next part of the program where we have invited representatives from both Denmark and the UK to give us their perspective on the role of the private sector in a green transition and towards COP26. With us today, we have Tom Thackeray, who is Director of Infrastructure at the Confederation of Basic sorry, of British industry. And we have Mr. Thomas Bustrup, who is the COO of Confederation of Danish Industry. Thank you uh, for joining us today on the first panel. And I will uh, let you start out by answering a question, namely, uh, we've heard from the minister that ambitious climate goals uh, in both national and global uh, settings are key to reach the uh, Paris Agreement. I'm sure you both agree, but more importantly, what role do you see the private sector play towards reaching the climate targets? Uh, Tom, I think I'll pass the floor to you first. Thanks very much, um, and, and thanks for having me today. I hope you can hear me okay, and uh, apologies for my domestic background. I, uh, the COVID restrictions in the UK mean that I'm joining you from from uh, one of my one of my rooms in my house. So, um, but to answer the question around um, the importance of ambitious targets, I think you know, at a global level, fairly obviously, this is a global challenge that we're facing. So we need governments across the world to come together, to join forces to tackle it. So global ambition is is obviously important. At the national level, it's also important because that's where the policies, the frameworks, the investment environment is created by national governments so we need national level targets to set those signals and then at a business level it's also really important you know companies need long-term strategies they need to decide what they're going to invest in and um, over a number of years and, and establishing those targets is, is critical so it all flows down from the global level to the national level to the company level and and from the cbi's perspective i think you know, the private sector is going to be so important in, in realizing those objectives and those targets that, that the minister is just been speaking about. So, you know, companies are the source of many greenhouse gas emissions, whether that comes from the transport sector, whether it comes from heavy industry, from agriculture, from the buildings that we occupy. The businesses create those emissions, and it's, it's, it's important to be realistic about that. And therefore, there is something of a, a moral responsibility for the private sector to act to reduce those emissions as well. So there's that responsibility piece, but I think also, and most importantly, uh, I believe, and the CBI believes, that it is within industry that there is the entrepreneurialism, there's the innovation, there's the investment in technology that will see those goals realised and see those goals realised through the power of the market that can ensure that it's done at the lowest cost to consumers and to society, because, you know, to avoiding people having to pay too much for decarbonisation is absolutely essential uh, if we want to bring them with us. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and uh, look forward to the discussion. 
Thanks very much, Tom. And I'll pass the floor to you, Thomas, also to, to answer what role do you see for the private sector towards reaching the climate goals? Um, thank you, Finn. And, uh, and as always, when it comes to, to these issues that we are discussing today, uh, DI is very much in the same line as, as CBI. So also from our side, thanks uh, to you, Tom, for, for being with us today. Uh, of course, the political targets are, are crucial and that we have ambitious targets are crucial in order to, to get there in due time. Uh, but uh, quite fast to get to the conclusion that uh, it is basically the business uh, sectors all around the world that has the, uh, the solutions to reaching those ambitious targets. Uh, so that's very important that uh, that the business community all over is is acting as part of the solution and not part of the problem and of course it's also seen uh, as uh, part of the uh, solution uh, more than part of the problem i think in these days it's also relevant to ask the question whether this corona situation that we're all in should that postpone uh the ambitions should that postpone the uh the uh, the importance of business uh, acting now on this and uh and maybe in some sectors they are they are they are in a situation where it can be difficult to look at long-term climate issues but in many many other sectors it's maybe even better timing now than uh, than before covid 19 because of uh, a lot of things are up in the air and also a lot of uh, investments are actually ready to be done uh, now. So I think it's extremely re relevant also to mm -hmm. have this discussion today besides uh, the corona. My last point here will be competitiveness. Of course, that's something which is always seen as a core part of the, the business response to a lot of things. Uh, more and more, I think uh, we see in Denmark, and I think the same is, is in, in Britain, that the competitiveness is also, if you want to be competitive in the future, you need as a company, as a business, to be on the forefront of this. This is what your, uh, your customers, whether it is B2C or B2B, this is what they will demand in the future. So, of course, there is a competitiveness issue whether uh, some sectors will be uh, burdened by having to, to uh, fill up with these uh, regulations coming. But there's also a competitiveness issue in the other way that if you do not do it, then in the future you will not be a competitive business. So something good may come out of the Corona crisis after all. We should hope for it. Yes, yes. Uh, Tom. I I, uh, I just wanted to, uh, to turn to you. Um, just before the uh, Corona crisis, a couple of months before, you published the CBI published its report, the Low Carbon 2020 is a decade of delivery. You called it. The report sets out uh, action, actions essential to the UK low carbon success over the next decade, while also calling for all political parties to agree and implement a long-term national plan to combat climate change. Um, how do you, if you look at that report, which came out, I think in late November last year, um, is it still relevant? Do you see it or has it been overtaken by the Corona events? and the Brexit? Oh, I think it's, it's probably even more relevant now than it, than it was when we, when we wrote it. Obviously, so much has changed um, within the economy, within society, and, and, and within business, business since that time. But one thing that hasn't changed is um, commitment within the CBI's membership, at least, to, uh, to really uh, hold on to the concept of a green recovery. Um, and I think actually this is uh, something which is different from the global financial crisis. So if you look back into the early years, post, post 2010, business were not so galvanized to uphold the progress that had been made towards decarbonisation in the early part of that decade. It really fell off the agenda for politicians um, over those years as well. And as a result, the progress that we have been making on uh, decarbonisation started, started to wane uh, within industry. But um, through our discussions with uh, with businesses and increasingly with government as well, um, there is much more uh, belief and positivity around the 
uh, the concept of the green recovery and the fact that we have an opportunity to reimagine and reinvent some of the industries as that the coronavirus has, has given us the opportunity to do. And obviously from a UK perspective as well, the fact that um, we'll be hosting COP26 uh, in a year's time brings about a milestone. And um, it's important as host, I think, to, to set a leadership example to show that when you make commitments that you are um, you are holding those and you have the, the trajectory which uh, shows that those, those ambitions can be realised. So over the next 12 months, uh, I think it's important that um, UK business and UK government work together to make sure that we are on that path to net zero emissions 2050, which is, is what we set for ourselves. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Thomas, turning to you. Uh, in Denmark, the private sector was invited into uh, by the government to be part of the 13 so-called climate partnerships, came up with recommendations, I think more than 365 in all, to the government on climate goals and plans. What do you see as a major outcome so far of the climate uh, partnerships? Well, uh, we hope that uh, the major outcome will be that many of these uh, 375 uh, proposals will actually be be uh, followed and implemented uh, in uh, in Denmark. Uh, that is still a, a hope, a wish. I believe in it. And, and the, the business sector and DI will, will, uh, will continue to push that agenda. But I think maybe the, 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 the biggest outcome so far is, is even sounds boring, but it's a process. Mm. Actually, that you can gather uh, the top representatives of all sectors in Denmark, all business sectors in Denmark, and make them use not hours, not days, but, but weeks of their time in, in interacting with government officials in, in how to to uh, to come up with solutions in their specific sector that can ensure that uh, that in within that sector that we are also in the future state of the state of the art when it comes to to uh, to uh, to climate I think that is quite an astonishing process and outcome and uh, we have said you know if we can help other uh, countries, uh, governments, business organizations in sharing that knowledge, we would be more than willing to do that because it has been quite a powerful mm. process. So you see actually a possibility of replicating the, the model behind the climate partnerships in other countries. Definitely, definitely. Maybe not 100% because mm. countries are different. Uh, actually, we're starting in Kenya for all countries in the world right now. We, we have people there trying to assist both Kenya government and the business association, camp it's called, mm. in, in Kenya in, in trying in their environment to do a similar thing. Mm. Uh, Thomas, turning to you, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the climate partnership notion in Denmark. You, I'm, I'm pretty sure you may have heard about it at least. Do you see that as a possible way forward? Uh, in the UK? Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's really an interesting concept. I think what what's clear is that um, private sector has many of the solutions to, to help us deliver the uh, the ambitions that we've, we've set for ourselves, but it's going to take a partnership between the public and private sectors to, to, to really bring that to life and to make sure that we can do that at pace. Um, and so the, the dialogue that seems to be established through the partnerships that you, you, you've, been, you've been talking about is um, really attractive and perhaps something that the UK can start to, to learn from in, in the months ahead. From our perspective, I think we are um, also very conscious of the need for best practice to be shared amongst industry and amongst members. And we are thinking about ahead of uh, COP26 next year, how we provide a platform for businesses across across the world to share their experience about their own in-business action that they're taking towards cutting emissions. Because I think what we're what we're seeing through the interviews that we've taken that we've had we, that have, have taken place with companies is that yeah, no one has all the answers. Everyone can learn something from mm. other industries, from other sectors. And often there's not that um, that forum for them to be able to do so. So in building this platform, we're calling it the Goal 13 platform. Uh, based on in-depth um, interviews with company leaders and sustainability executives, 
we're digging under the skin of what is making a difference to these companies that are successful in cutting emissions and making sure that they can form partnerships with, with other businesses um, to help them solve those problems today. Uh, and we're looking for international partners to, to help solve that. So again, hopefully that's an initiative that can uh, have some have some influence outside the UK mm -hmm. as well. Uh, in answering one of the questions before, Thomas mentioned the fear of uh, losing competitiveness in connection with this uh, green transition. Is that uh, something you hear from your members also in, in, in the UK? Um, yeah, I think competitiveness is always uh, an issue that, that businesses are conscious of. Um, I do think that if governments and the policy frameworks are set up in a in a correct way, correct way, then some of that risk can be mitigated. I think when when businesses worry about regulation or worry about uh, the uh, policy environment, is that things change very very quickly. So if you go to a budget or a, a prime ministerial announcement, and suddenly the regulation on which your business model is designed is pulled out, the rug's pulled out from underneath your feet, then that's very difficult to deal with, and that's why businesses get frustrated with regulation sometimes. In the climate space, what's important is if you have long lead time regulation where businesses can adapt their investment intentions and start to build a plan around, that is absolutely acceptable and necessary and it can help businesses actually create markets and opportunities. Um, so I, I think there's, there's a bit of a nuance behind the competitiveness question. Um, and as well, I, I completely agree with, with Thomas's um, assertion that actually you're more likely to be uncompetitive uh, in the modern economy, if you are not taking steps to become more sustainable, and as well as the customers demanding that, I think in the investment community is going to demand that, and the drives towards green and sustainable finance means that you know, investors are going to be looking at their portfolios in the future and making sure uh, that the companies that they're exposed to have taken steps uh, towards cutting emissions and improving their sustainability. So it's a bit of a no-brainer. Okay, um, I would like to touch upon uh, another issue which is also definitely related to, to this uh, aspect we're talking about because to reach the ambitious climate goals not only in Denmark or the UK or globally there is a huge demand and need for new technologies, more innovation. Thomas, how do you see stakeholders ensure the best conditions to develop these, con these con uh, innovations and actually also uh, policy framework plays an important part also, I think. Yeah, but as I, made, as I mentioned a little bit in, in the beginning, I mean, a lot of things are up in the air right now, uh, which is a possibility also of making changes quicker than would normally happen. And I think uh, in the European space, uh, we should really look at how we spend our money in the future and also in the near future. Uh, and I think there is a willingness. I mean, there is a clear commitment in the uh, recovery plan of uh, is it 750 mm -hmm. uh, billion uh, uh, euros that uh, a large part of that should be used in these investments mm -hmm. and in research uh, dealing with uh, also green transition. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is maybe the biggest opportunity that we have right now in order to go down uh, that, uh, that path. Tom, you and the CBI and, and your members will be in a special position uh, after January, uh, after December 31st this year. What, uh, what, what is your point? How do you, what is your take on, on this uh, need for innovation and uh, funds for innovation in particular, and where should it come um, from in in the UK? Yeah, I, I think it's, well, it's it's really important that um, the right funds are channeled into innovation, and I think it's it's also important to recognise that um, different technologies that are going to be crucial um, in the transition towards uh, zero emissions are at different stages of development, and we've had a great experience in the UK with, uh, through innovation and through technology, reducing the cost of renewables and particularly offshore wind that was mentioned mentioned earlier. Um, but other, other technologies, the development of the hydrogen economy, carbon capture and storage, they're more nascent and they need to 
support, they need the right policy frameworks, and they need the investment in the uh, in the technology to make them them viable viable for the future. Um, so it's important that we see the policy framework materialise. That will see that investment channeled from industry and from the public sector. Um, I'd say from a UK standpoint as well, what what the CBI is interested in is, um, and naturally would be interested in, is is making sure that we don't just um, conduct the early stage research um, in the UK, but that we are thinking about the value chain and we are thinking about how that um, that research and that technology is is driven into industry and is adopted by industry in the UK. And we're creating supply chains that can enable the manufacturing of the technology domestically and in Europe. Um, because yeah, in the past, we've been very good at coming up with those ideas which are then exploited more effectively in other parts of the world. So we are uh, very conscious of our need to develop that strongly. And I think uh, an important consideration for, for the UK is um, given our, our leaving the European Union, is making sure that our brightest and best research institutions have access to the research networks that are available across the world and that they have the opportunity to collaborate on an international basis um, that they've been able to do previously through the links in, in the European Union. So, Ms. You mentioned a little earlier that uh, you are already engaging in Kenya, uh, the Confederation of Danish Industry. Uh, when it comes to the green transition, obviously Denmark plays a very small role. If you look at the figures, I mean, our CO2 emissions uh, only account for, I think, 0.1% of, of, of total CO2 emissions on a global scale. Where is it you see that Denmark can actually punch above its weight? Mm -hmm. I, I think it is to to inspire uh, um, other governments with the process that we described before, but mm. as, as importantly uh, by solutions, technologies that can be used. I think it's it's important that we all acknowledge that um, that our societies and uh, and are different. We talk about Kenya. Mm. But also that the industrial mix are different. When, when, when Tom and I uh, are talking to our uh, partners in Europe, uh, business organisations in Europe, and we talk about the very ambitious uh, climate uh, targets that we have, often <laughs> we are looked upon as uh, you could say uh, uh, some flower power uh, <laughs> green nerds that are, are just saying that and, and, and have an opportunity of having those very ambitious targets because we don't have very heavy uh, industrial mm. base, neither in, in Britain or in, in Denmark. And, and that is true. Mm. But that doesn't mean uh, that, uh, that, that we cannot also be examples. I mean, we also have uh, a cement producing plant in Denmark. We only have one left. Uh, but we have one, and that is the most uh, environmental uh, cement producer in the world. So it's not a coincidence. It doesn't mean that, that that we cannot also be examples within within heavy industries. One of the the, the, the speakers you have later on representing F. S. Smith, it's the same. I mean, they are, are, are in the mining industry and they are producing plants, and but they are also. Uh, uh, world leading when it comes to sustainability within their business mm. so that so so it's not only two camps you know one are, are are not heavy industries and some are heavy industries fighting each other we need to inspire each other in all sectors in all industries in all levels okay finally uh tom uh, tom what what is your best guess for the cup 26 in glasgow next year what do you hope to be achieved at the cup. I, I think um, at a very high level, I think it's, it it would be great if national governments could um, to come together and realise high levels of ambition um, towards a, achieving uh, a, achieving um, limits in rises in global temperatures. That would be obviously be the, the ultimate goal that, that we're aiming for. Uh, and it seems that you know the the, tra the trajectory that we've seen in recent months is is really good. Um, so uh, more hopeful now than perhaps would have been even um, four to six months ago. 
Um, but even independent of that, I think that there is an opportunity for business organisations to to lead the way where sometimes where the, the national government won't. So um, there, there is a concept around uh, you know a, a race to race to zero that is the UN is developing, which is open to business actors as well as state actors, and it's uh, an opportunity I think for for more companies to to step forward, even if their national government isn't willing to do so. So I think what the CDI is willing is interested in doing is forming those partnerships, leading our own business community in the UK to, to come up with their, their plans to, to reduce emissions and hopefully uh, achieve net zero, but also um, coordinating that internationally and having a clear statement from industry that they are up to that challenge um, and encouraging their government to follow suit. So that's what I'm hopeful for for COP26 next year. Thank you, Sam. Thomas, what are, how do you see prospects for a successful COP26? Well, maybe they are better than a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I think in, in, we, we have processes in, in, in all countries, and, mm. but, but I think we are we are getting there where there is a strong, uh, real commitment also from some of the larger uh, economies in, 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 in that we need to deal with this also because there is a pressure from people from uh, states from cities uh, from employees uh, in, in going this way so on that happy note thank you very much to our two panelists uh, Tom Thackeray CBI in in London and Thomas Bustrop CEO of Confederation of Danish Industry. Thank you for your input. We will be back in a very short while. Stay tuned, less than a minute or so, we'll be back again. Thank you. By 2050, Denmark will be independent of fossil fuels, an energy efficient society powered by renewables, fueled by nature. We're well on the way to a greener future, but we're not quite there yet. Let's share experiences and inspire each other to continue the journey. It was the oil crises in the 1970s that triggered our green transition. We began to invest in renewable energy and focus on energy efficient solutions to break our dependence on imported oil. Since 1980, Denmark's economy has grown by more than 90%, while our energy consumption has remained the same and our CO2 emissions have been reduced. But we still need to make progress. Sustainable energy sources must be harnessed globally and across borders. We need to create a balanced, intelligent energy system to power our common future. Around 70% of Denmark's electricity is generated by renewables. We invest in green infrastructure and technologies across biomass, solar, geothermal energy, and not least wind energy. Our degree of self-sufficiency is around 85%. It's not just a matter of security of supply, we see it as a long-term driver for green growth. To finance the green transition, we foster public and private partnerships and let citizens invest through shared ownership. A key driver for green growth is energy efficiency. Buildings alone account for 40% of global energy consumption. How Welcome back. And Sorry, I'm now... just going to say some building work happening next door, so I don't know if you can hear the drilling or... Now to oh. our second fireside chat of today, where the theme is the role of cities and business in raising ambitions in the Paris Agreement. With us on the panel, we have from London, Shirley Rodriguez, who is Deputy Mayor for Environment and Energy. We have Fleming Wootman, who is Vice President of Marketing, Communications and, St and Sustainability at F.L. Smith. And we have, um, F.L. Smith is a global supplier, I should say, of uh, production facilities, equipment, and service solutions to the cement and mining industries. And finally, we have Kil uh, Kjell Strøm, who is Senior Vice President of Danfoss, a global leader in cooling, heating and power solutions. Thank you all for joining us. As before, I will let you all start out by answering a question, namely, 
by now it's clear that there is a need to accelerate the global transition towards uh, COP26, but also when looking at cities accelerating their ambitions. Cities consume over two thirds of the world's energy and account for more than 70% of global CO2 emissions. Um, what role do you see cities play, not only in reaching, but also in driving climate ambitions? And I think I'm going to start out by you, Shirley, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, um, and to the Danish Embassy and the partners for inviting me today um, to talk a little bit about what we're doing in London. And it's really great to see so much support uh, and interest in the role of cities. Um, and absolutely, we, we play a, a really key role. Um, we're taking the action that's going to support the achievement of, of the, those global goals. Um, <clears throat> C40, um, uh, London's a member of, of that group, have estimated that 70% of the um, global emissions reductions needed to achieve the Paris Agreement will have to occur in cities, by cities. And we have a, a great history of being ahead of the game when it comes to climate action. Um, and this is often in advance of or despite uh, some national governments. So um, we also play a, a great role in showing to governments and citizens and businesses on you know, what is possible. Often um, the action that cities take are then replicated in other cities uh, and then nationally and then internationally. And C40 is a great example of that, that sort of best practice sharing um, and, and replication and, and many other city networks too. And, and mayors absolutely uh, uh, play a key role in trying to raise the ambition of nat uh, national governments. And that's a, a role that London uh, is trying to play uh, with um, the COP26 being held in the UK um, next year. And then um, another aspect is obviously that we set, um, in setting a sort of bold climate agenda, we were able then to foster action um, and help encourage action by others, whether it's individuals, businesses, communities, um, and, and that helps that sort of cumulative impact to really raise the game and help us reach um, those sort of targets that we need, uh, we need to uh, achieve very quickly. And in terms of London, uh, there's lots of, lots of stuff going on, you know, do have a look at our website, um, but, you know, the mayor has, was, you know, declared a climate emergency, he, he wanted London to be a zero carbon city by 2050, he's recently changed that date to say that we need to accelerate action and to do that by 2030, um, and that, you know, even despite people saying that might not be achievable, we, you know, his view is we can't afford not to try. And also it's going to help um, deliver the green jobs that we need in London, make sure that the city is globally competitive, um, but also that we are a, you know, a responsible city, that we are responsible leaders on climate change. And we've made some great progress, um, lots of recognition for our efforts. C40 um, have noted that we're one of the select group of global cities that have already peaked our emissions, we're on a path to net, net zero. Um, and we've had some NGOs like um, WWF, um, recognising us uh, for our zero carbon progress, CDP, um, have, you know, have also been checking uh, on our actions. Um, some other things that we've been taking action on are, uh, for example, we've implemented the world's first ultra low emission zone, been retrofitting our public buildings and social housing, creating new woodlands in our green belts, um, divesting our pension funds from fossil fuels, more cycling and walking. And it's all these types of actions that we need to accelerate, all of them, if we're going to be net zero by 2030. Uh, and maybe just in finishing, I just wanted to, to clarify that, we, as, you know, as with many other cities, you know, we're, unfortunately we're in our second lockdown in London, um, but um, we are already thinking about how do we recover from the pandemic and ensure that we have an economic and social recovery that tackles the climate and ecological emergency. Um, we, we are absolutely clear, the mayor is absolutely clear that we can't make progress on our recovery without looking to, to being a, a zero carbon city. Uh, and to that end, we've recently agreed um, a Green New Deal for London as, uh, as a key focus of activity, looking on how we grow London's economy, create green jobs, but also address inequalities uh, and, and make sure that we hit that zero carbon target. We put some money behind that. But most importantly, we're taking action and, and sort of watch out for, for a couple of announcements coming up. We have our London Climate Action Week next week um, and uh, some announcements, I think, on some funding uh, programmes too that will be coming up as, 
as a way of showing the leadership by cities which will really drive the climate action we need in the run-up to, to COP26. Thank you very much, uh, Shirley, and, and interesting to hear that your emissions uh, have already peaked. Um, I want to move on to you, Fleming, first. Um, we hear that leadership is, is vital. Uh, does that also go for cities, in your view? Absolutely. And uh, LFL Smith, we, we are sort of the premium supplier of technology to two industries that in, in the context of COP26 and, and the UN lingo is called hard to abate industries. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and they are uh, both cement and mining, you can say hard to abate industries, and they are also, in particular cement, you know, uh, about six, seven, eight percent of global emissions. So they are industries that we need to deal with now. But I think that you can say that the uh, technological uh, revolution within this space towards low carbon technology is way ahead of the political reality. And that's probably where the cities then become quite unique, because sometimes uh, between countries in the context of the UN and, and even in, in, the, in the European Union and so on, sometimes you can, it takes a little bit of time to agree on things. And you would say that mayors and cities and deputy mayors, you know, are a little bit sort of, you know, quicker on their feet to get stuff done, to get implemented. And that's why I think uh, if we need to some seek a faster deployment of some of that technology, I think that needs to happen in the cities. And let me just give you two examples of that. Today, for instance, we have technology whereby you can produce cement with 30 to 40 percent less carbon emissions compared to an average, right? But but where's the market for that? Mm. So so that's that's really a big question mark. You could do the same for aluminium, for copper, which again is the backbone of any modern city. But where's the market for it? And that's where you can say that cities are super important because public procurement is such a key great. thing, and and more than half of the cement actually ends up in a city somehow involved with the decision making under the authorities of the mayors and so on and so on. So there's a chicken and an egg, we have the technology, but we also need to be pretty quick because these are industries that have investment cycles of 25 years or more. So if we get it wrong, we lock ourselves into inefficient technology for a very, very long time. And we don't have the pleasure that we can afford ourselves to miss out on one of these investment cycles. So, Cities are key, and, and public procurement is also very key to this. Thank you. Kelly, what's your take on it? Well, I, I think, first of all, I think to, to answer your first question regarding what's the role of cities, mm -hmm. um, to be clear, we can't solve the climate change crisis without working with the cities. I mean, cities are 70% of, of all global emissions. Urbanization is one of the mega trends of the world. We're going to see cities and urbanization only grow in the current period. So this is really the key part of the puzzle. Without that, we will not solve it. Now the question is, you know, what do we do? Mm. And, and I think one of the really good pieces of news is it's a lot more, a lot easier to, to drive energy efficiency uh, when you have a high people density. And that's what cities are. And that's why I'm, I'm so happy that, uh, that uh, people like uh, Ms. Rodriguez here are taking the leads in, in big cities like London, because this is really what we need to, need to get done to, to really move on it. Mm. Uh, turning back to you, Shirley, I know that uh, in London, you uh, have teamed up with a number of business partners like Siemens, Sky, Tesco and others, companies that all have set science-based targets. I read somewhere uh, that you said that they actually pushed you to move faster on zero emission transportation in London. Could you expand on that and also touch upon the role of partnerships in general? Um, yeah, that, that's right. We we have uh, they're, they're members of our London Business Climate Leaders, and it's um, a, a program working with a, a select few um, leading businesses headquarters in in London. And we were work, you know, we wanted to work with them, uh, knowing that they they were already leading on climate change, but wanting to see what more they could do to support London's aspiration to go further, faster on climate, but also on a number of other issues. So, you know, would they um, commit to reporting on their greenhouse uh, gas emissions? Would they do more on electrification? What could they do about um, switching to renewable electricity, uh, energy efficiency targets, and so on? And I'm really pleased to see that, that you know, that, that they, have, they are stepping up and have made a number of commitments. Um, and in the context of the, the London recovery, um, we've set up, Zadik has set up a, a board um, with a number of business organisations, representative organisations, you know, like our CBI, I, I, I see you just had, um, uh, and others, in order to see collectively how might we work 
to tackle climate change, um, but also, uh, you know, in the context of looking at our economic and social recovery. So, so the key to, to, to our activity is collaboration. We cannot do it alone as a city government nor can businesses do it alone. We have to work together with individuals, you know, um, to take action. Um, and, and many businesses are already taking strong action, um, but not enough. And I think that's really what this approach is, is about, is how do you get everybody to, to move faster? Look to supply chains to make those shifts, look to your customers, look to your staff. Often they're the ones that are saying to, to businesses, you know, we want to work in a, in a really socially responsible organisation, what more can you can you be doing? Um, you know, they're a massive asset. So I think, you know, that that's pretty key, you know, key. And we're going to carry on doing a lot more in the run up to COP in, you know, looking to, to our businesses to see what more we can do. And in terms of the public, you know, we've seen through um, the, the, the impacts of COVID-19 and the lockdown, um, a much greater appreciation of the environment and people wanting to shift behaviours to, to greener ones, more walking, cycling, uh, and so on, you know, and all this helps reduce the carbon footprint. And again, this is an important lesson because we know that it's, it's everybody has to, to um, take action, but the public are more open than, than, than often we think they are to take faster action. And certainly the polling that we've undertaken in London is, is saying, you know, we don't, we don't want to go back to what was before. We want to keep some of the benefits that we've seen, cleaner air, um, you know, much safer streets, um, more livable streets. Um, but we don't expect this in, in, in our recovery efforts to be seen as a sort of green silo. This should be embedded in everything that we do, which is why why Zadik is absolutely clear that it's integral to our, to our recovery efforts. Um, so we just need to, you know, carry on working together to make sure that we, we foster and grow those positive attitudes, give people the tools and action to make these choices easier. And we have a lot of those tools in London. Um, uh, you know, from mapping to somewhere where there are opportunities for small businesses and, and big ones to, you know, to build heat networks, for example, to, through to where we might um, deliver more green space, you know, more tree planting, mm -hmm. uh, all, the, all those sorts of things. Good. I just wanted to stay with you just for a brief second. Uh, you mentioned energy efficiency and, and your views were definitely echoed here among the two Danish mm -hmm. companies. It's very high on your political agenda in London, but if you look at it from a national perspective in the UK, I know you have been calling for uh, a higher priority at, at some point. Uh, is there more that could, that could be done as you see it in the UK today? Yeah, I mean, we've estimated um, that we, in order to retrofit our buildings, uh, it's in the order of 10 billion pounds, um, 61 billion to meet the, the one and a half degree climate action plan we have in London. We are wanting government to change a number of things to allow mayors, you know, not just not just not just the here in London, but lots of mayors across across the country to go further and faster on on retrofitting uh, for energy efficiency, both our our homes but our, our buildings. And part of that is more funding. The government has said that there is funding available, and they have made some funding available, but but nowhere near enough. I think they've they've released something around three billion. They promised nine billion, but you know that that's for the whole country, not enough. Uh, not enough for London. We need to be given powers to, you know, devolved down to London to be for us to be to take further action, faster action on on energy efficiency. Um, but in the meantime, you know, we're we're getting on with it. So we have a number of um, technical assistance programs that um, I just came off a call earlier about what we're doing around uh, retrofitting our homes, public sector buildings, and creating new heat networks. And you know, through the recovery efforts, you know, how might we work with our um, key sectors in London, like the NHS, university sectors, our local authorities, to really build that sort of collaboration and really um, move faster. And a key effort is going to be around financing. So we're doing some work on green finance, you know, looking at a, a financing facility, working with the Green Finance Institute in London, around, you know, how might we create the and mobilise the, the private finance in the absence of public, public finance, public sector funding, to really help us uh, reach those retrofit goals. And we know that, you know, as we said, this is great for carbon, but we know that by reducing or making our homes more energy efficient, it helps with tackling fuel poverty. We have, you know, one in 11 households in London are, 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 are fuel poor, not able to pay their bills, but it helps on health, you know, to improve health outcomes as well, which as we know from COVID-19 is such a big, big issue. Mm. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kill. I, I want to turn to Danfoss because you have been uh, asking for more focus on energy efficiency yeah. in Denmark. Uh, what is it you are, you see we lack here? No, I think um, I'll, I'll try to start, start with a few yeah. facts and then we can, we can drill down to it. I mean, we just talked about that 70% of, of emissions are mm. from cities. We know that 55% of energy consumptions is from buildings. You know, we know that heating and cooling of those buildings will help, like like Mr. Rodriguez said, uh, on health uh, as well as energy efficiency. And we know that the return on investment of those technologies that already exist today can be paid down in three to four years. Mm -hmm. So for, for anybody on the on the uh, London Business Center or financial scene, this should be an amazing investment opportunity. But we need to find a way how to graph them, how to, to build those packages so they can be invested in by the financial sector, because it's very difficult for them to, to find individual buildings. The technology exists, the need is there. We need to find a way and work with the cities to find ways that the, that the either public or private financing can find its way into those opportunities, mm. because the technology that's needed to solve this crisis exists today. Mm. Fleming, what is your say on it? Yeah, I think that um, I think that this year that you see a lot of a lot of great news coming out. One of them out of that I'm in particular encouraged by is actually out of London by the London Metal Exchange. Because one of the issues we also had is a lot of the commodities that used to build a city uh, is, 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 you know, the price setting happens on the London Metals Exchange. And they now announced this year that next year they will have a, a special contract for low carbon aluminium. And, and you say, why does that matter? It does matter because this is the first time ever for any of the metals or the minerals that actually there is a price mechanism for those who actually want to bring to the market the low carbon part of it. And that was again the same example that if you want to provide low carbon cement, you need to make sure that there's customers. But now we finally get that for mm -hmm. metal and minerals and, and the London Metals Exchange has been very instrumental in doing that. And that is important. The big customers for that will be first and foremost, Apple, it will be Nestle, that needs it for the Nespresso uh, capsules, but it will also be companies like BMW, Volkswagen Group and others who now are have a chance now finally to demonstrate that they put their money where their mouth is. Mm. And then as, as the deputy mayor also was saying, then we need the, the pension funds and other institutional investors also to help us out here. Because again, we are running short on time, not just for our panel, <laughs> but, but also when it comes to climate change. So, so we need to make those investments now into the technology that is ready. And again, the pension funds will be key there together with the cities. Mm. We are running out of time, I know already. Uh, I think I've been giving a cue now to uh, terminate the <laughs> discussion. I'm sorry, I had a lot of more, lot more questions, surely also for you. But thank you very much for uh, being part of this discussion today. Thank you to Fleming Woodman from FL Smith and to Ken Strom from Danfoss. We'll move on to the next item, which will be uh, the, fir the uh, Nick Bridge, the UK government's special representative for climate change. Small we will have a me a great pleasure to introduce not the first speaker of today but the last speaker of today Nick Bridge who is the UK government's special representative for climate change. Nick was appointed to this position back in May 2017. Before that he was permanent representative of the UK to the OECD from 2011 to 2016 and prior to that he held a number of different positions among them 
diplomatic postings to China, Japan, and the US. Nick, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear and see me? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful for your uh, technical staff shifting me from the opening speaker to the closing speaker now that I've jumped onto a different technology. We're, we're all living through this, aren't we, at the moment? So thank you so much for the flexibility and for the opportunity to speak to everybody. Thank you, the embassy, uh, Danish embassy, and thank you, State of Green. I know from my own visits to Copenhagen uh, and to Denmark, uh, uh, the the state of green work and, and how and how impressive it all is and, and 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 thanks to the minister for him taking the time to engage. Um, I think it was the chance for me just to say a couple of things. Uh, I think first around COP uh, COP 26 and the run up to COP and the diplomacy um, that we are doing. And then secondly, uh, I think briefly about the UK uh, and and our story our message and the fantastic and essential nature of the partnership with Denmark and with other European partners. So um, I'll just do a, a, few, a few short minutes on, on each of those um, topics. I mean, on COP, let's, let's start with the, with the newsworthy item of uh, a certain Joe Biden. Uh, so we have had uh, that uh, great news um, that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson uh, uh, mentioned over the weekend that um, uh, for us, um, the partnership going forward with the US will be a great opportunity to, to focus on, on our shared uh, climate change agenda. Uh, President-elect Biden has said that, that he will rejoin the Paris Agreement on day one. He's put together a, at the moment, a, he has proposed a $2 trillion package to decarbonize the electricity system in the US uh, by 2035. So that news out of the US gives us all a huge uh, lift. Uh, it was preceded though a few weeks ago by another really uh, significant signal from China where President Xi Jinping, as you know, uh, committed to uh, carbon neutrality before 2060. Um, and then uh, interestingly, uh, weeks later, we saw from Prime Minister Suga in Japan, from President Moon in Korea, these other very significant uh, announcements around uh, net zero. So about a year from uh, COP, which we delayed uh, due to the COVID uh, pandemic, we are now starting to see these uh, very significant shifts and moving of the, of, of the positions. And we are determined as the presidency of COP in, in partnership with Italy, fantastic European um, collaboration, uh, we are determined to drive this home. The next step for us will be on the 12th of December when uh, Prime Minister Johnson and President Macron uh, and the UN Secretary General Guterres, along with uh, our Italian and Chilean partners, will host a climate ambition summit. And the, 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 the dates for the aficionados out there, 12th of December, of course, is five years to the day since the Paris Agreement. And we want to say that, you know, the commitment was always that five years on from the Paris Agreement, every country would come forward, really step up and enhance their commitment. And so we want to give as many countries as possible that opportunity this December, and then for other countries to follow right through next year, so that COP26 next November does what it has to do. And let me just reflect on just what that is that it has to do. So the Paris Agreement was a historic political a signal uh, that all countries agreed to come together and tackle this challenge. But we all know that the commitments under the Paris Agreement were way off track where they needed to be. And the science since then has only got more alarming. Um, we may already be in some of these uh, Earth system uh, uh, shifts and tipping points. Um, uh, so we cannot overemphasize the importance of moving faster and at scale. So COP26 is really about saying five years and now six years on from, from the Paris Agreement, we ratchet up those commitments and we do what we have to do, not in one jump, we can't get to net zero overnight, but we do what we have to do in this five year period to bend that curve of emissions and to support financially and technically 
all countries to adapt and be more resilient and cope uh, uh, with, with what's coming. So that's what the, uh, the COP26 has to do. We'll basically take up the themes of energy and transport and nature slash land use. And underneath that, we'll have adaptation and resilience. And, and underneath all of that, we'll have climate finance, shifting the financial system overall to tackle uh, this problem and, 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 and result in more sustainable investments. So those are the economic themes. And the big difference, you know, uh, the politics has been very difficult since Paris. Think about uh, the positions of President Trump and Bolsonaro and uh, Putin. Very difficult politics, uh, which is now beginning to shift. But the big thing that's changed since Paris is the economics. And we've heard, I know I saw the back of the panel discussion on energy efficiency, on energy investment, uh, on the way that we move around with our transport systems, the way that we build our houses, run our infrastructure, run our industries, it now makes economic sense to do this in a clean way. So we don't have any barrier anymore except the political will and the transition uh, to doing it fast enough and at scale. Uh, so, so that's the big shift that we want to try and harness. We want to take this from being a narrow political conversation to being a whole of society, whole of economy uh, shift. Uh, and um, in that way, we have the businesses and the cities and the states and the communities pushing governments to say, you can go further, we're going further, you need to go further. And then we have some of the governments that are in more leading positions pushing their businesses and to, do, to go further. So we have this um, way that we have a, a reinforcement of the politics and the economics to make sure that world leaders do what they have to do, we hope, uh, at the end of next year. And so just a, a, a final minute, I wanted to focus mainly on that, that COP strategy. Um, and, and, and obviously Denmark's ambitious position is exactly the kind of thing we need to, to, to partner with, to push that further and to, to help lock in a really ambitious European position. But just a word in, in the final minute on I said on the UK position uh, to remind uh, colleagues that we, we locked in our um, world's first Climate Change Act binding legislation in 2008, but that last year we upgraded to net zero. Uh, and we're the first major economy in the world to do that. We've doubled our commitment to international finance, uh, international development aid on climate. We've committed to make all of our development budget um, climate proof and climate compatible. We're driving huge campaigns around the world under COP, but having to show the UK is in a position, a morally authoritative position to push those campaigns. So the Prime Minister will soon be announcing more details of what we'll do domestically to ensure that we deliver our net zero commitments because we're on track at the moment, but we're actually looking to be off track in reducing carbon in the carbon budgets in around eight to 10 years time because we've done fantastic work on, 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 on like with, with, with you on offshore wind, the biggest offshore wind producer in the world, getting out of coal, but we've got much further to go in our buildings, in our infrastructure. Uh, in our uh, transportation and in our land use. So we've got some very ambitious plans. Um, I listened and I know uh, we've got great messages from Shirley, uh, Deputy Mayor and, and others about the sort of the government frameworks and regulatory frameworks and, and financial support that's needed to drive that home. So a big domestic agenda as well to make sure that we are in a, a diplomatically and politically authoritative position to be the presidency with Italy at COP that we want to be. So thanks so much again, uh, State of Green and Danish Embassy. I hope that gives a, a quick run through how we see things uh, in, in the UK government, working with all our partners at all levels, bringing out the voice of the youth, the civil society, the business to help governments do what they have to do. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick. That was really wor a message worth waiting for. This was our last element of today's Green Talk on the path towards COP26. I hope you all learned something and will keep the discussion alive. This event is one of State of Green's so-called Green Talk series of webinars where we share knowledge on green solutions and technologies. You can follow us on stateofgreen.com to learn more, and you can actually also sign up for our newsletters to stay updated on the green solutions. Last but not least, on behalf of the organizers, a big thank you to all of our speakers today and an equally warm thank you to all of you around the world for following and engaging actively in this seminar. I hope you feel inspired.
by what you have learned today. Thank you and goodbye.